Chapter 10 of the Sindar You'll remember that in Beleriand, the westernmost part of Middle-earth, live the Teleri who never took the final journey over the sea to Amman. And you'll also remember that they are called the Sindar, or the Grey Elves. They are spread all over the place, from the Falathrim on the coast, led by Círdan, all the way over to the Eredluin, or Blue Mountains. However, all of them take Thingol, or Elwë, as their lord and king. And by learning from Thingol and Melian over time, they become the wisest and fairest elves native to Middle-earth. Now let's backtrack a few thousand years, back to when Melkor was first imprisoned. Sometime around 950 years into his imprisonment, Thingol and Melian's one and only child is born. Her name is Luthien. And just to give you an idea of her age, she's younger than Feanor and Fingolfin, but she's older than Finarfin, and she's going to be a really important player later on. Also during Melkor's imprisonment, the dwarves first come into Beleriand, over the Blue Mountains. They call themselves Khazad, but the elves call them Naugrim. Their ancient homelands are much farther east in Middle-earth, but they also have great halls and mansions in two places on the eastern side of the Blue Mountains. The northern one is called Belagost, and the southern one is called Nogrod. The, the greatest of their halls is Khazad-dum, but that's located in the Misty Mountains, much farther east, outside of Beleriand. You'll remember it as Moria, where Gandalf fought the Balrog. When the elves first encounter the dwarves, they're actually amazed because they had assumed they were the only creatures who could speak or make things. The dwarves learn elvish pretty quickly, but they don't teach the elves their language because they're really secretive about it. There's an elf who invents a writing system called Kirth, which consists of runes, and it never really catches on among the elves as a writing system, but the dwarves really like those runes. They like them so much that they adopt them as their own writing system, because they're easy to carve into stone. The two races have what can be described as a business relationship. They're not close friends, but they profit from one another. Thingol welcomes the dwarves to trade inside Beleriand, but very few elves ever go to Nogrod or Belagost. Once the Noldor eventually come to Middle-earth, the dwarves will get along with them the best because of their shared loves of gems and smith work and their uh, mutual reverence for Aule. Even though the dwarves go all throughout Beleriand, they rarely go to the coast because they're afraid of the sea. Meanwhile, Melian predicts to Thingol that the Peace of Arda will not last forever so he should build a great stronghold in case evil forces arise. So the dwarves of Belagost help the elves to build this new dwelling. And it's actually underground, like how the dwarves build their own mansions. And this great hall is called Menegroth, or Thousand Caves. And it's the fairest dwelling of any king that has ever been east of the sea. It's absolutely grand and beautiful and breathtaking. As time wears on, Melkor is still chained, but the dwarves begin to tell Thingol that there are still evil creatures that are roaming around more and more east of the Blue Mountains. Eventually, wolves, orcs, and other fell beings of shadow come into Beleriand. And this is when Thingol asks the dwarves of Nogrod to help in making weapons, because those guys are experts in forging steel and chainmail. The Sindar eventually learn from the dwarves how to make their own weaponry, so once they become well-armed, they're able to fight off these evil creatures and servants of Melkor. Peace comes again, for now, but they store their weapons for the future, just in case. And remember the Nandor, that Teleri breakaway group that stopped on the great journey east of the Misty Mountains and headed south along the Anduin? They are now scattered east and west of the Misty Mountains. These are a woodland people who primarily live in forests, and they definitely don't have any heavy weaponry. And when the fell beasts and evil creatures start roaming the land, they threaten the Nandor. So, an elf called Denethor gathers as many of his people as he can, and leads them into Beleriand. 
They settle in Osiriand and later become known as the Laequendi, or Green Elves. You read about them in Chapter 3. The original Nandor were led by Lenwe, and Denethor is Lenwe's son. Now let's fast forward to when Morgoth and Ungoliant arrive in Middle-earth, and Ungoliant attacks him. His scream can be heard by everyone throughout Beleriand. It's that loud. <laughs> and when Ungoliant moves down below Ered Gorgoroth, the Mountains of Terror, she poisons the waters in the area, and the mountains and valley below become dark with shadow and dread. And of course, Morgoth returns to Angband to rebuild and gather strength. The orcs of Angband grow in number exponentially, and they attack Thingol's realm. The only places where elves are congregated in significant numbers are the Falas, that's the coast, and at Menegroth. So all the other elves are just spread everywhere, thinly, all over the place. The orcs plan to attack Menegroth from camps on either side, one located between the rivers Kelon and Gelion, the other located between the rivers Sirion and Narog. This way, Thingol is cut off from Círdan and the Falathrim, so he calls upon Denethor and the elves in Osiriand to come and help. This is the first battle of the Wars of Beleriand. The orcs in the east are defeated, and most that try to escape and flee north, back up north to Angband, are killed by dwarves from Mount Dolmed. However, this battle does result in the death of Denethor and many of his people, because their weapons, remember, are very light, and the orcs are clad and armed with iron. So once the remnant of those who went to battle return to Osiriand, none of them ever engage in open warfare again, instead electing to hide in the forests. They get the name Green Elves from the fact that their clothes are green like tree leaves. Some of the Green Elves actually do go to live in Menegroth and eventually merge with the Sindar there. So they're kind of, you know, spread out. Meanwhile, in the west of Beleriand, the orcs have driven the Falathrim completely to the edge of the sea. Fingal hears about this once he returns to Menegroth, and in response he summons all his people that he can reach into the forests of Neldoreth and Region. And then Melian sets up an enchanted barrier around these forests. This fence of shadow and bewilderment is known as the Girdle of Melian, and no one can pass through it unless they have either her permission or Thingol's permission. Now this realm is known as Doriath, or the Hidden Kingdom, and it's safe from the outside world. The servants of Morgoth now roam freely throughout Beleriand, except in Doriath, and except in the two walled havens where the Falathrim now live. So now the scene is set for Feanor coming over the sea and burning the swan ships at Losgar. 